it really just feels like we're 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 going to be able to make a difference. You know, I was a, I was a terrible Boy Scout. I was the longest running tenderfoot in the history of Durango, Colorado's Troop 504. Uh, but I liked camping. And I, the one thing I took away from scouts was that you always leave a campsite better than you found it. And I think all of us, uh, the, the, my partners and I and the trustees, the deans, the faculty, all of us are really focused on leaving a better workers compensation industry than the one we found. And, uh, and there are a lot of good people. We want to bring new good people into the industry. And this is really what we're hoping to do. Welcome to It's Settled, the Amitros podcast. Each episode, we're going to dig into the humanity in workers' compensation and insurance claims, exploring the stories of injured people and those who support them, as well as the good work professionals are doing in the industry. And now, I invite you to join me, Sean Dean, General Counsel at Amitros and the host of It's Settled. Now, It's Settled. Let's get on to the episode. And I'm really excited today to talk about uh, Work Comp College with its founders, Mark Pugh, Bob Wilson, and Don Abrams. Really excited to get into this. Um, I guess just by way of background before I let uh, the three gentlemen introduce themselves, and they probably actually don't require much by way of an introduction. If you're in the Work Comp world and tuning into this uh, podcast, these are three uh, luminaries and visionaries and titans in our industry, and we're very happy to have them here today. But I was at Comp Laude a few weeks ago. I was starving. It was a beautiful day out. Um, I believe we had run the 5K to support Kids Chance of Texas that morning, and I hadn't eaten all day. And I was, uh, I, I had a craving for randomly for chicken wings. So I was walking down um, in Huntington Beach, uh, or actually, I was on my way back. I had had chicken wings, and I look and I see Mark, and Mark's hard to miss. He's pretty pretty tall guy. And we were on Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, and I walk into Mark and I had been seeing uh, rumblings of this work comp college. And uh, I'd, I'd watched a few of the promo videos and was reading the material and found it really interesting, but wanted just for my own benefit to understand more about what it was. And we're sitting on PCH on this beautiful Southern California sunny day. And as Mark was talking to me, I was getting really excited about this concept, and I didn't realize it was so close to launch. And I pushed Mark. I said, hey, why don't you and Bob and Don get on the It's Settled podcast with me? So it's settled. You're you're here, and we're going to talk about it. So um, before we get into it, I guess just for the benefit of the viewers, why don't we go around? Bob, I'll start with you, and then Don, and we'll wrap it up with Mark just real briefly, maybe a, a minute or two. Uh, who the heck are you? What are you doing here? How'd you get into comp? Uh, and then we'll get into uh, Work Comp College. Well, th thanks, Sean. Appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about Work Comp College today. My name is Bob Wilson. Um, uh, formerly, I was the president and CEO of WorkersCompensation.com, founder, uh, one of the co-founders of that company. Did that position was in that position for almost twenty three years. Um, I write a blog for the industry uh, known as From Bob's Cluttered Desk, um, where I think more people know the brand of the name, the name of the blog than they do me, probably. Um, and we started uh, Work Comp College, uh, and I now serve as the president of Work Comp College. It's an interesting question how I got into workers' comp. I got in the exact same way you and everybody else did, by complete accident, without any idea of actually how I wound up here. But uh, I've, I've told people many times this industry is like Hotel California. You, want, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never, ever leave. Because if you notice, the people, the faces never change. The the uh, the, the names of the companies may change, the positions may change, but the faces never change. But uh, it's a good industry. And I, I think um, with what we're, we'll get into with Work Comp College, uh, we want to make it a great industry. And I think, think that's what our, our goal is going to be. Thanks, Bob. Don? I, by training, I'm a physician assistant, and I was doing orthopedic surgery. Uh, I moved to Texas in 1989, and in, in looking for the, the next thing to do, uh, I, I took a job as a case manager. And in Texas of that year, they, they changed the workers' comp statute dramatically. And one of the things they introduced was impairment ratings. And I had done those in my practice in, in Boston before I moved to Texas, 
And of course, in, in, in medicine, we have a saying, how do you define an expert? He's the guy from out of town with slides. So I was that guy, I was from out of town, I knew about apparent ratings, and all of a sudden, I was the expert. So I, I stumbled into workers' comp as a guy knowing a little bit about impairment ratings, and that kind of morphed into other areas uh, of uh, workers' comp and helping adjusters out from a clinical perspective as to what best practices is and what really is a function of that compensable event. And then I came up with this idea uh, a year and change ago and talked to Mark a little bit uh, at a meeting we were both at. Like you, he was, he's, Mark's tough to miss, and he's just a, a real bright guy. And I just had to reach out to him and say, hey, Mark, I got this idea. And uh, the rest is, as I say, is history. And uh, I'll let Mark finish off that story. Sure. Mark, you've been on the podcast before, but why don't you just real, real brief recap of uh, who you are? Yeah, I appreciate it, Sean. Um, I've been known as the arts professor in the industry for a decade or so. I've uh, been involved uh, uh, for three decades in the, in the industry, actually started from an IT standpoint. One of the guys that worked for me at Choice Point was doing nights and weekends for a little company that did utilization review. You know, got tired of doing nights and weekends. I was looking for a different challenge. And so, um, like Bob and like Don, and um, you know, accidentally kind of got into comp. Um, it's been interesting. And when Don mentioned this idea to me uh, in la- last November of 2022, the very first person I thought of was Bob Wilson, because he's been talking about workers recovery for a decade. I've been talking about a biopsychosocial treatment model for a decade. Um, And that was really Don's point is kind of creating an educational platform that really kind of um, understands the entirety of the system uh, at the same time of being infused with that workers recovery claims advocacy type of a model. And so we're really pleased to be with you, Sean. Thank you for the the introduction, um, uh, you know, for being a part of the podcast. But uh, we're very, very close to launch and a lot of work has gone into it. I would be remiss in, think, in people thinking that this is just about the three of us. We've got a tremendous board of trustees, great deans that are affiliated with the eight schools that we have, and a faculty that's just phenomenal. So this is very much a community-driven, team-oriented um, uh, kind of setup. Uh, you know, n- none, none of the three of us have ever adjudicated claims. Um, so when we talk about claims, we need people who have done that. And we've recruited some folks, some high experts in that regard. And uh, so we're really happy to be very, very close to launch. Let's, um, before we kind of get into exactly what Work Comp College is and, and the nuts and bolts of it, I, I kind of want to back into it by uh, maybe um, trying to conversationalize the problem that 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 uh, Work Comp College is solving, because all great ideas like this one look to solve a problem. And um, a, a few of those that come to mind, and, and I, I've only been in the, the biz for 14 years. You've all been in it longer than I have. But ever since I got in, it was, we're losing talent. We're losing talent. We're losing talent. We're losing not only talent, but but these folks that have uh, embedded institutional subject matter knowledge. Um, and then it seemed like there was a rush to get in these very granular um, educational programs that were sort of this, I guess, for lack of a better word, one and done, super technical stuff that only really appealed to the folks that we're losing uh, and didn't didn't focus on the holistic um, aspect of claims. And then it seemed like there was a shift going, oh, my gosh, we're getting too technical. We need to focus on uh, the workers and we need to have uh, an empathetic claims model and we need to change the vernacular we're using because it's too it's it's based in procedure and legal. Um, and it seems like there's just these really quick shifts that we're trying to do. And then there's folks like yourselves who are doing amazing work. But like Bob said, we're, we're kind of in an echo chamber because it's the same people at the same conferences. Um, yeah. And I see, uh, and I know there's other problems that it's solving, and I'd like you to talk to them, but I really see um, Work Comp College is, is solving for these and many of the problems that, um, that we're facing as an industry, uh, the least of which is to change um, likely a, a, a misperception that it is strictly an adversarial process between uh, uh, an individual whose employer did them wrong or an employee who's trying to game the system. Um, that's a lot there. I guess, Bob, I'm going to throw it to you a little bit maybe to talk about some of the problems that WorkComp College 
uh, solves for before we talk about exactly what it is and, and what it's going to achieve for people uh, in our in our work comp world. Well, yeah, Sean, I mean, there's a lot in that opening uh, question or opening salvo. We could probably fill the hour on that, I think, because there are so many different facets. Um, I've been in the industry since 1999. Prior to that, was in human resources and technical recruiting. I uh, did web development, which is actually how I accidentally wound up. Uh, you know, you end up with the domain workers compensation.com. You know, you're, we tried selling shoes with it, it didn't work. So we thought we'd, you know, come and serve the industry. Um, when I first started, uh, there were some fairly decent formalized training programs by some of the larger carriers. Uh, but of course, you remember the tech bubble burst in 2000, there were stock problems. The If you look at the investment ratios, what companies were earning from their investments um, in those days, it shrank dramatically. And a lot of things went by the wayside. And one of the very first things were good formal training programs. And uh, we really shifted. I think over the years, I saw us shift from a from an industry that that trained some of our own to stole some of our own, where you could find them and steal them from somebody else, that was just as just as well. And uh, particularly some of the state agencies really suffered from that as they got people trained, they got picked up by the private sector. Uh, so that is one fundamental issue. Um, you are correct when you mentioned there are some there are some training programs out there, and there are some good training programs out there, but they're an extraordinarily technical process driven, which is really the way the focus of the industry has gone. Um, you know, in the last 10 years, a lot of us have been talking about workers recovery or biopsychosocial issues or claim advocacy based claims. Um, but fundamentally, you still listen to and you hear about insurance companies that have 200 case files on the desk. You know, yeah. each adjuster's got 200 case files on the desk uh, and they talk about files. We don't talk about human beings. We talk about files. And uh, we've kind of lost that human interaction and the recognition that these are people, you know, it may be a file to an adjuster, but it, to, to the person that file represents, it's their entire life and it's a life in crisis. And we don't think about that in that way all the time. And a lot of our people are leaving. We've been talking for years about the brain drain that we're facing, the, um, uh, the you know, the, the graying of our industry. And I realize this is an audio podcast, but if they could see the three of us, they'd recognize that we are in that camp. Um, I'm catching up about, too a little bit. I, I wasn't good. No, you're, you're, you're looking you're looking younger than the three of us. I'll tell you, but it's it's a uh, because I, you know, <laughs> yeah, Martin, it's because he is. It's, it's well, thank you, yeah. thank you, Mark. Um, but we look around behind us, and there's nobody there to take our place. And, and that brings me to another point. We've done a terrible job as an industry of marketing our services to attract young people into the industry. Yeah. You know, I, I tell this story, Mark, I'm sure is sick of this story. Um, we were at a conference in June at the CCWC out in California. Uh, we were at a reception, a professional uh, had her 21 year old daughter there. And we were having drinks around a table and someone asked the daughter, are you going to follow your mother into workers comp? And her answer was very succinct. It was hell no. And someone said, you know, why? Why won't, Why don't you want to go into workers' comp? And I interrupted and I said, let me guess. You think we're a overregulated, process-driven, stodgy and boring industry that does nothing but file paperwork all day. And she said, yeah, that's right. And, and my point to her was, I asked her, I said, you know what workers' comp really is? What workers' comp does? And she said, no, What? What? tell me what it does. And I said, if workers' comp, if we do things right, if we actually do them right, we're actually an industry that restores broken and shattered lives. We take people who are in crisis and try and restore function and purpose to their life and restore the quality of their life. That is an extraordinarily noble purpose that we never discuss yep. when we're talking about hiring people. And if you want to attract the current generations coming out of college today who want to make a difference, they want to have that noble cause, that's the message. And that really is those factors are what we are going to be trying to address when we launch Work Comp College. Um, that that's my really long answer. Well, was, you had a long question too, so I can give a long. Fair answer. enough. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I guess uh, what, 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 whoever wants to take it, um, if if you kind of just so we can set up things and start talking about it, you know, what what is the you know thirty second uh synopsis elevator pitch if you will about what work comp college is is an introduction to folks who are listening in the industry who who uh want to know more about it and then we'll we'll get into the nitty-gritty 
Mark, you want to take that? 30 seconds is a challenge for all of us, but. <laughs> I, pr I may have a, a better likelihood of fitting it within 30 seconds. And I've already used 15 seconds. So um, <laughs> now it's what we're after is to provide a very broad and deep understanding of work comp industry. So the professionals inside of it know what their role is and how their role impacts the other stakeholders in the system. But by virtue of the broad and deep understanding of work comp, we also want to infuse that with the claims advocacy, workers recovery, biopsychosocial model. So we humanize this um, uh, effort on our part to achieve, as Bob mentioned, the noble, noble purpose. I love that. So I guess to that end, uh, I was really fascinated how you gentlemen set this up um, as a as a higher uh, education institution of learning. You set it up like a college. And as someone who never wanted to leave college, after undergrad, I went to grad school and got a master's in education and then went to law school and I just didn't want to stop it. I think it's an incredibly effective um, pedagogical delivery mechanism, the way it's structured. But why did you what made you, and I agree with you, but what made you hone in on, okay, we're going to set it up like a college? I mean, because you have a board of trustees, you have faculty, you have a curriculum set up like a uh, college course would. Um, and I think it lends itself well to the complex nature of workers' compensation and trying to teach all the different facets of it. But what what drew you into um, the college? So and I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to let one of them answer it, Mark or Don, but I am going to say, since you love college so much, that registration will be open and you're welcome to enroll in work <laughs> at right. college very shortly. And, and to, to that point, you know, to my knowledge, as a PA by training, we have national set of standards that, which we practice by. There is no national set of standards uh, for practice as a workers' comp uh, uh, final minister. As Bob pointed out, it, the person taught you that the, the schools went away. You know, the, the larger insurance companies did away with it as a cost-saving measure. And you, you learn from that person sitting next to you or the, or the cubicle two rows over, whatever the case may be. And there are no national practice standards. And we are losing, as you mentioned earlier, that subject matter knowledge. So to warehouse all of the appropriate aspects of handling that injured employee from the biopsychosocial, from the whole person recovery, and having a place where they could go online, learn it, and refer to it, and again, establish a, a, a wide parameter of what are best practices to apply in this situation. And, and having that, uh, you know, we, we took the college seat because we wanted a place where a variety of people could speak to it. When Mark, Bob, and I first started this and we we're looking at the board of trustees, we really wanted guys who were really smart, knowledgeable, great people, but didn't have the, the gravitas, as you will, of a Bob's clutter desk or Rx professor, you know, like myself, you know, I don't, I don't have that, but we got people involved. We have regulators, we have educators, we have all these different people who brought to uh, bear all the things that they think that person should know. When we started, Mark's idea was short course, maybe 30, 30 credits or 30 hours of education. And Mark, what's the number now? It's like 55, 56 hours now? You know, it, it's it's that much that people we believe need to know and need to have in a warehouse so they can refer to, so they have the basis for doing all the best practices in handling that claim file. Well, and when we came up with the the name Work Comp College um, dot com, we're the, the technical name of our company is Workers Compensation Educational Services LLC. Our, our brand name is Work Comp College dot com, and there are some, you know, we we we. We, we are open on our website that we're not an accredited college, but it was really Mark's idea to follow the full trustee dean format. So I'm going to let him speak to that. And then if we have an opportunity, I'd like to speak a little about the people that are actually doing the job and, yeah, and uh, who are going to be working about this. But Mark, you can go in a little bit about your form on the trustees and with the dean structure and how you set this up. Yeah, well, I think, you know, a college has different schools of discipline. It provides a well-rounded education. And that's really what we wanted to get to is that this was not, Sean, when you were originally talking about training that oftentimes is very narrow, very focused on technical proficiency and really helps that particular discipline, um, you know, work through things. 
But oftentimes people don't really understand the universe, the ecosystem of work comp. They don't understand how many stakeholders are in it, um, how complicated it is, the nuances of that, what things happen upstream affect you and how you affect things downstream. Um, these, this is a huge, tremendous number of dots that need to be connected. And so when we start thinking about the best way to kind of portray, this is a broad-based uh, variety, multidimensional, giving you the full ecosystem, the college really kind of lent itself, um, you know, to that approach. So, you know, we've got School of Claims, School of Humanities, School of Legal, School of Medical Management, School of Regulatory Legislative, School of Return to Work, School of Risk Management, School of Stakeholders. So when you hear those eight schools, and then we've got a general studies school as well. When you hear the, those eight schools, it shows eight different viewpoints or perspectives on the thing. You know, the vast majority of claims examiners don't know what the vendor management process is. They just know that when they go to select a service, they have three vendors they can select from. They don't understand how legislation turns into regulation, which turns into case precedents and law. They don't understand how risk management process is underwritten, how the underwriting process goes that sets premiums. Lawyers don't understand the claims process. The claims people don't necessarily understand the mediation process. So when we leaned into it, we really wanted this very broad, what we call Work Comp 360, kind of that full picture view. We felt like the college platform best represented it. Um, not that everybody goes to college, but I think even if you don't go to college, you kind of understand that there's different schools of discipline. And then it gives us the opportunity to tease it out even further. So that's when we recruited the deans that are specifically responsible for the curriculum and the faculty within those particular schools. So we've had some folks, and I think Don mentioned the fact that we wanted to democratize this. So we have provided people that you definitely have heard names of. Um, you know, you've heard their name, they've been everywhere, but there's a lot of really smart people in our industry that has never been given the soapbox, never been given the responsibility, you know, to have something like this under their purview and to have the gravitas, the credibility that comes with it. And those people are hungry. They want to participate. They want to contribute. They want to pay it forward. And so we've been focused very much on democratization within the team but also democratization of the of the of the participants. So, you know, there's a lot of people that never are given time or money to go to conferences where all the smart people are. They don't have the, the opportunity to spend two days with a wide variety of agendas that's covering all sorts of stuff. They just don't have that access. COVID provided webinars that kind of did a little down payment, but we still got a whole bunch of people that have never been able to sit at the feet of really smart people and kind of learn from them. And so we want to democratize that from this concept of the students. And so that's kind of the thought process that went into it. And then it sets the foundation for our master's program, it sets the foundation for state specific. So we'll have a workers recovery professional for Montana, for California, for Texas, that goes into the legal claims and ethics nuances of those, those individual states. We've got an athletic department, which sounds kind of weird, but um, it, it's a way to recognize the fact that athletes have a unique sense of discipline. They have a unique sense of teamwork. They have a unique sense of being able to see, see the whole field of play. Do you think a quarterback, quarterback needs to see all 22 players and the coaches on the side? That's the kind of people that we want in work comp to understand the entire system. So as we kept teasing it out and went into this college, every time we looked at it, it goes, this gives us another opportunity to kind of dive into the col college domain, but do it to constantly belabor the point that we want to create a situation ecosystem where everybody's after the win-win, the win for the employee and the win for the employer. So I got to ask you a question. So you said athletic department. So all colleges with athletic departments have a, a mascot. Is there a mascot? Does one exist for Work Comp College? Absolutely. Absolutely. We are the WorkCompCollege.com Flying Bulls. All right. And people people who have met me for some reason think it's a completely appropriate uh, a mascot. We have some trustees who are big Iowa Hawkeye fans, and we have some trustees that are Longhorn fans. And in our discussions, early discussions, in addition to the serious discussions, uh, we started talking about a mascot and we came up, you know, it started out in a humorous fashion. We would be the flying bulls. But the reality is we are going to embrace that for the comparative purposes that Mark laid out. 
related to athletics. We're even giving five athletic scholarships a year. We'll fund them to uh, anybody who played collegiate or professional sports who is now in the workers' comp industry uh, can apply. We'll be able to apply for those scholarships. Gary Davis, the executive director of SOCA, the Southern Association of Workers' Compensation Administrators, is our athletic director. And he's assured me that we're going to dominate the league this year. In fact, he actually thinks we're going to be, uh, you know, we'll be a standout and the practically the only one in our league, it seems like. So uh, we'll, we'll own it. Well, but it, it is, a, it, we are quite serious in that respect that we, we do draw a comparison there. Our, our Pong team is awesome. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, we're, we we got the angles all nailed down to to make sure that we keep that ball in play. So was it beer pong or regular pong? Say, we're, That's we're, what I want to know. I was going to say we're we're at send it to beer pong. I've got that one now. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> it's Nintendo pong yeah, from the nineteen eighties. Yeah. So one thing that came to mind when we're talking about this model is, you know, one of the benefits of going to a college is that you have an alumni network after you graduate, and you know. Uh, Bob, you, you mentioned it in the opening that it's it's always the same faces, the same voices that are being heard. And and this to me is a way to expand those voices yeah. and that and that network. It, it was is there a thought that these folks, you know, because because it's not one and done here. It seems to be a holistic uh, right. setup where it's not just you graduate and then that's it. You're done. I mean, these folks right. are going to have the ability to communicate with each other and have continuing education after the program, right? They will, they will actually have the ability to communicate with other students within the system itself, within the virtual campus. We will be rolling out an alumni association uh, that will provide additional resources and continue education. The real focus is we want to build a community. We want to make sure that the, the 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 certification itself is the workers' recovery professional certification. That's the base certification we're coming up with, and we want that the people who have that to be part of a of a broader community. Again, big picture, thinking about what's what's best for the industry, what's best for personal continued personal development, and for support. Um, we we've talked with a couple different um, organizations about appending live events to their annual conferences, so that we may have a day or a track for our own students to come in for personal education. Because we are a virtual school, but there's a great deal of value to face to face interaction and networking. And we want to encourage that and foster that wherever we can. So we envision that happening down the road, some live events to supplement some of the things that we're doing virtually. And we may have actually live virtual events in the sense that um, not, not just pre-recorded, but panel discussions. We're going to be offering webinars. Um, Judge David Langham and I used to do the hot seat on another website. Uh, we're going to do a very similar uh, uh, webinar called The Point that will be based on WorkCompCollege.com. Uh, but I think that, yeah, to, you, to answer your question, this is more than just one and done, get a certificate, thank you, and have a nice day. Um, it's a substantive program. It's serious education. It's going to take some effort to get through. And we want to build on that uh, with a community of professionals who are, who are proud that they've earned that, that designation. And, and one of the things that Don has mentioned uh, in the past, and Don, maybe you can help kind of tease this out a little bit, is that the, the, the really focus on the P part of the WRP, the professional, um, you relayed that to kind of your PA kind of thing um, and creating a community of, of professionals that can bounce ideas off of one another, continue to learn from faculty and deans. I know that was a part of your original premise in our initial discussion. It was, you know, as I mentioned, as a PA, I graduated uh, my PA school in 1977 and my PA number was 1059 or something like that. Now there's, uh, at the time, there's only 32 PA programs in the country. And now there's 136 PA programs and 150,000, you know, PAs working as well as nurse practitioners. And what we have is a, a group. We have the, our annual meeting. It's grown in scope and, and things like that. So taking that standard and applying it to uh, the, the work comp community and having a making this a real profession, you know, being a, it's something that people can aspire to or maybe get their education in a, in a formal college or whatever it takes to get there so that they have a group of people, like-minded people who, and they're not alone. So if they have an issue and they're a remote adjuster, there's somebody they can call or, or reach out to, or a bank of uh, educators who are available via email, phone call, whatever the case may be. And that we develop a community um, and a relationship of people. Where humans are social beings. You know, I was just watching a thing last night about gorillas and you watch how a family of gorillas stays together. Well, our family 
needs to stay together as well and, and develop. And, and we have more people who are like-minded and we can reach out and touch each other. It just benefits the entire industry and we get best practices going forward so that all people are taken care of, be it the injured employee, the employer, whoever is that appropriate um, stakeholder. You think there's an opportunity? I'm just thinking of younger folks who who are joining, you know, large claims organizations. They may be going into marketing, or sales, or underwriting, or or positions that are not traditional. Um, I know I know uh, Bob doesn't like the word adjuster. I don't either. Um, uh, but uh, traditional uh, non claims handling roles. I could see great benefit for someone who's you know, in charge of a company's website uh, on the tech side to go through this program who's in workers' compensation. Um, it doesn't seem like the curriculum would eliminate a non-technical person. It seems like there's a track for anyone. So maybe talk about the ideal student who can uh, can can apply and go through this. Well, we, we've certainly evolved in that area. You know, when the three of us first started talking, we were really thinking about claims professionals, people in managing direct claims. And it was really our trustees, our board of trustees, as they were talking about what should be done, what could be done, pointed out that these were going to be this was going to be a program that would be valuable to far many, far more people than just the claims professionals. And indeed, we have um, some gold associates. There are companies that have actually invested with us, not just to bring people through the system, but they're financially supporting us and have embraced this concept. Um, and uh, one of them in particular uh, is looking to bring in a, a certain number of the seats that they've purchased in advance, not for their claims people, but for their underwriting people and some of their business development people, because they want them to have a whole picture of where they fit within the industry. I, I can tell you the industry itself is extraordinarily siloed. Um uh, several years ago, David, Judge David Langham and I did a series of meetings called the Workers' Comp Summit. We had a series of three meetings in three different cities, comprehensive discussion, brought in stakeholders to try and represent just about every factor that we could think of, of every section sector of the industry. And one of the constant comments we got after each series of meetings were, peop were from people who said, you know, I didn't think this would be a useful exercise, but I'm amazed at what I learned about uh, what other people deal with. I had no idea what the other side deals with. Yeah. And, and having dealt with some very large insurance companies over the years in negotiating sales of our products in a previous company, um, I I've learned, you know, I'd be on a call with 30 people from a large insurer and listen to them debate about how they're going to negotiate internally figure, or figure out who to talk to to do something that they need to get done. Um, you know, I joke that Dilbert is alive and well in corporate America. Um, doesn't mean they're bad people, but they're in a, in a heavily siloed system where claims doesn't know what underwriting does. Underwriting doesn't know what marketing does. You know, um, sales may not know what anybody does. Um, that's a joke about salespeople. Never mind. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> But I think that it, it can benefit anyone who touches the life of an injured worker or or touches a system that touches the life of an injured worker could actually benefit from the WorkComp 360 vision uh, of this particular program. One of the things that we talked about is our, we're getting our initial launch out, our initial product for that claim file handler. OK, be whatever title they go by. And but we have started our conversation about. The next level, Mark alluded to the, the master's level program. And we want to have training programs for the next several levels of people handling files. But we also want programs for that individual who does uh, workers' comp for the risk manager or workers' comp for that person working in the public entity. And one of the things I'm really looking at, and we haven't talked a great deal about, is workers' comp for physicians where we can teach docs, good docs, who do things the right way and not just, I'm not going to get off of that topic, but understand the workers' comp system, how they can benefit the injured employee and, and still take care of their own needs relative to being in practice. Having been in practice for a number of years and dealing with workers' comp patients, why howdy? From a clinical perspective, it can be a pain in the tuchus. And therefore, training these folks up on how we can support them, how to best do that, is another one of the uh, uh, projects we have uh, online for the, uh, the near future. Hey, Don, is Tukas, is, is that, I, I haven't heard that in a clinical setting. Is that, a, is that set somewhere between the ankle bone and the shoulder bone? Somewhere. I have so, right. you know, Don, Don's on fire today. He compared us to a, a family of gorillas uh, earlier. And, and I will tell you, I am not checking Don for lice. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> 
Well, and, and Sean, I, I wanted to kind of um, not belabor the point, but, you know, it's been interesting as we've had discussions with a lot of people around the country, a number of folks that we didn't think about are interested in it. For example, we've had some discussions with brokers and agents who want to better understand the work comp system because it's a small component of kind of their overall portfolio, but they're asked to be experts in that. We've had ombudsmen that are interested, uh, that are representing injured workers that are very interested in understanding everything. We even had some customer service um, folks uh, from a service provider that's very interesting um, as well uh, in, because they interact with a variety of stakeholders and they want to be able to better serve the customer. So as we continue to have discussions with universities, Don's even had a discussion with, a, with an organization that reaches out to high school students. You know, as we have these consistent op, uh, conversation with regulators, with everybody, there's a lot of people that go, that makes a lot of sense. And we hadn't really thought of the curriculum being applicable to them. But when we start teasing out that work comp 360 and the claims advocacy, don't you want to be on the leading edge of the trend, which is treating um, humans as humans? You know, all of a sudden, everybody, in addition to claims examiners, are interested. So, you know, we've got this business plan. We're actually going to be meeting in the first week of January to kind of tease out what we're going to do in 2023. Chances are really good that list will change between now and then and again in February and March because the more we talk to people, the more ideas that they have. And we're very amenable to um, feedback and constructive criticism and ideas from our trustees, from our deans, from our faculty. And we're going to have a feedback loop for our students as well. So students can tell us what we may have missed, what we should focus more on, um, different faculty, you know, different things like that. So we're leaning into this wholeheartedly as a living organism for the next decade. We're going to continue to grow this and every year produce 100, 150, 200 courses that continue to kind of push the envelope of what we know and what we need to know in the industry. That's great. So one of the big, I guess, staying with the, the collegiate theme, you know, one of the big topics is, is access to education and cost of tuition. Uh, just, I guess, brass tacks, you know, how, how much does this cost? Is this something that's accessible to an individual or do they need to go through their organization? And how does that work? This, this is accessible to individuals. Um, when we are live, uh, people will be able to come in and, and, and enroll uh, for $995. That's the cost of the certification wow. program. Right now, we have pre-registration open uh, for $400 savings. You can pre-register for $595. We've had a surprising number of people take advantage of that, um, and which is which is a real honor and both puts a lot of pressure on us because, you know, they have they put down good money for a product that doesn't exist yet. Um, and uh, it will, though. November 17th is our launch date. Uh, and I think up until about November 12th, people will be able to pre-register at that 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 rate. We also have uh, packages where com we have, you know, of course, discount rates. If a company wants to bring 30 or 40 or 50 people through the system, uh, they are not going to be paying $9.95 per person. We have a government rate that's a very aggressive government rate because, frankly, we want to encourage as many regulatory bodies. Uh, and we've had several regulatory bodies commit and or express interest to sending their people through the system. Uh, that government rate is $295 a person. Um, we have a nonprofit rate, you know, so there are different rates they can do. We also have some scholarships. Um, yeah, we talk have about several, those. We have several uh, law firms who have purchased named scholarships uh, for that will be given to people. They can apply after we launch the college. Uh, we will have applications online. They will be able to apply, and uh, it'll be based primarily on economic need, or uh, we we might give preference. And we're setting up a scholarship committee uh, that's part of our trustees and deans. It will not be the three of us making the decision. I think Don will head up the scholarship committee. Um, but we may have an emphasis or interest in people who are new to the industry who want to go into workers' comp uh, and giving an interest. And the other thing we are... I've been a longtime aggressive supporter of Kids Chance. Uh, I'm on the board of directors of Kids Chance of America. I'm a founding um, board member and for, former president of Kids Chance of Florida. Um, we've supported Kids Chance. By, I've supported through my old company since the year 2000. Uh, any Kids Chance scholarship recipient anywhere in the country 
uh, who wants to go into the insurance industry has an automatic scholarship to go through work comp college. Wow. We'll pay that I, way. I love that, Bob. That, um, that's such a great thing. Kid, kids chance is near and dear to me as well. I sit on the board in the, in Massachusetts. I think that's fantastic. Yep. And, well, I mean, and, and it's a way all, all the time about trying to get the younger generation involved. This is, this is incredible. Well, and that's what we're trying to do. And, and you know, one thing about, you know, if you were involved in kids chance, these kids are tough and they are committed they often choose uh, careers related to what happened to their parents. I mean, in terms of after the accident, they get a, they go into medical, they go into social work, they go in, and we'd like to encourage them to come into the insurance industry, help us make a better industry. And they certainly can do it from a point of empathy because they've been through that process. Their family's been through that process. So we, for us, it was a, it was a no brainer. And John, I just like to touch real briefly, you brought up the alumni association um, that is a monthly fee of $19.11, which gives a lot of value. And if people look at that as kind of a random number, but we're, buried, we're, we're into symbolism. And 1911 is the year that the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire happened in New York City that really started the constitutional work comp movement in the United States. And so, you know, we're trying, even in the pricing, we're trying to you know, incorporate and reinforce where we come from, our roots, the original grand bargain. Bob, uh, one of the in initial courses that students will take is on the grand bargain because a lot of people don't really understand that. So a lot of ways that we're trying to reinforce this, the athletic, the teamwork, you know, goes in the athletic department, the, the scholarships, the paying it forward, bringing new people into the industry, the $19.11 per month, which is the 1911. There, there's just a lot of ways that we're trying to constantly incorporate, you know, symbolism and importance into our, our, our strategy. So people walk out of this and go, this really is a cool industry. I can make a difference here. Uh, a, a, you can make a negative difference by doing it poorly. What we want to encourage is people making a positive difference by doing it well in a team where the primary people that, that win are the two primary stakeholders, the employee and the employer. Will there be electives? Oh, will there be electives? <laughs> oh, boy. How much time do you have? Yeah, we. I, I've coined the phrase one to infinity electives, and that's really where our growth is going to be. Um, so I mentioned, uh, Don mentioned, we're probably in the mid fifties as far as um, core courses to start with. In a year, we'll have 150 courses. In two years, wow. we'll have 300 courses because we're constantly going to be looking for new subjects as new trends arrive, as faculty, as we get student feedback. That's really where the growth, in addition to the state specific, the discipline specific, the master's program, you know, there's going to be a number of other programs there, but the electives that are continuing education is really we're going to be leaning in. And those can be 15 to 30 minutes. They can be quick hitters um, that really focus in stuff. They can be deep dives into a mock mediation, which the vast majority of the industry has never seen or heard how attorneys actually work through the compromise process to get to a final settlement. So that's that's really, you know, it's fun to put the core together. It's fun to set the foundation and go, this is what a workers recovery professional needs to know. But I think it's going to be even more fun to just constantly keep our curb feelers out and look for new opportunities to continue to expand the horizons. Who knows? I mean, in a couple of years, we may have 15 schools of discipline because we find different ways of narrowing things down. But that that's that's definitely going to be a humongous area of growth for us in the future. And, and if you think about it, who knew about COVID two and a half years ago and how did it affect the whole workers' comp world? And, and you know, uh, being a clinician and reading all the literature, we, we have a saying that the half-life of a medical education is, is 15 years. When COVID came out, I think it was closer to 15 hours. I mean, daily, different articles are coming out, and those people handling files had a real difficult time. So this would be a great platform to put for us to put together that, that next disease process or next major uh, situation that, that affects workers' compensation and get the right people in place, record the lectures, and have them available, particularly for our alumni or, or anybody else who may want to participate. So as a prospective student, someone's listening to this going, yep, I'm in. It sounds like class is in session on November 17th. What's this? And is it, is it done like by a semester? How long's the program go? What, what's the, what's the cycle of education look like for an incoming student? 
It, it is a self-driven program. Um, we have we've we've had internal debates about how long it will actually take an average student to get through. We've been talking about estimating uh, three months for a full-time employee to to get through the program. This is a, this is substantive. It is not a weekend Pilates certification at the Hilton Garden Inn. Okay. Um, it, it's a lot of information. Uh, it is. Um, now we we do have like one of our our companies uh, that has already signed on is planning to give their employees an hour a day off off of uh, off the system where they can go and take one of the courses do one you know those people will be able to uh, finish considerably sooner. Uh, it really is going to be self driven. There's no specific time requirement that they have to get it done within three months or six months. Um, but we we. It is going to be a self-driven process. Now, Mark will, Mark can explain that we we are planning actually quarterly graduation, virtual graduation ceremonies. Uh, we will be mailing. Uh, you'll have, be able to get a certificate virtually at the end of the process if your GPA is right and you've completed all the courses. But we will also actually frame and mail one along with some other uh, uh, materials to support uh, your, your accomplishment. Um, but I think that's that's what we are estimating right now, if, I, if I've answered your question. Yeah. Yeah, we, we kind of like the Southern New Hampshire University bus kind of thing, but we don't have that kind of money. So we're going to actually get a 73 Pento yeah, uh, basically. And, and, and deliver it. But um, we do want to make it a big deal because a lot of times people get certificates and maybe they post on their social media. They got it. Um, they add it to their LinkedIn profile. They add it to their resume. We think this is a substantial investment on their part. And we want to celebrate the fact that they work through this curriculum and we want to make them feel special, which is why we want to have those, um, you know, those quarterly celebrations. There may be opportunities to have in-person um, events like that periodically. We have even talked about having, um, as we build that community, RIMS oftentimes have chapters in different cities. We've even thought, you know, as a part of the Alumni Association, having gathering points for people in the metro Atlanta area that have all graduated, graduated with the WRP and they're all working from home so they don't have an office necessarily to go to, you know, we could facilitate and kind of uh, um, um, encourage them getting together. So, again, the, the whole concept of college just gives us kind of platform to go in all sorts of different areas, which, um, you know, the fertile uh, creative minds of the three of us, the trustees, the deans, um, it, there's going to be some bad ideas um, and we'll get rid of them very quickly, but there's going to be a lot of good ideas because you don't know if they're a bad idea until you try it. And so sure. we're going to constantly be pushing the envelope on how we can um, incorporate and create this community of professionals and make it special for them. If I could build on that too, for a coach, we've mentioned the trustees and we've mentioned the deans. Uh, one of the things, I mean, we've had just incredible support come out of the industry for this concept. We announced it and I, I am uh, from regulators on down. I was surprised at the response and the offers we've had for help from regulatory bodies um, who have asked us, you know, said anything we can do to help, let us know from people just in the trenches who want to make a difference. Um, but one of the things that's really impressed me is the quality of people who have come forward who want to be part of this. And yes, there's, you know, there's a, no one's going to get rich doing this. There's a small financial model. There's a financial model. They can make some money down the road from this. Um, not a single person has come to us and said, how much will I make if I do this? They've come because they have, they have knowledge to give and they want to make a better industry. And, you know, we, we had a call the other day with a, a large TPA who is considering our services or our, our system. And the question was, of all the training programs and certification programs out there, why would I choose youth, the three of you? And my answer was, if it was just the three of us, I wouldn't choose us. <laughs> I, mean, would, I mean, we have the concept, we've done the spirit, we've spearheaded the, the effort, but it has taken a life of its own. And, and, and if you, I encourage people to go to workcompcollege.com, look at who the trustees are, look at who the deans are. At the point that we have recorded this podcast, we have not yet published our faculty, but it's an extraordinarily impressive list of people. In fact, I have actually no idea what I'm doing here. I'm so outclassed by the people who are now supporting this. Um, it's, but it's just been really, really impressive. And, and I think it speaks so well for this industry, which can be very poorly maligned in the media and the national uh, um, national attitude, if I could say, uh, national opinion. And I, I think that's unfair. And we just it's, it's part of it is our messaging and there are people who can recognize we can improve that. And they've stepped up. 
it's been a really very positive experience. Well, I think to I'll, I'll toot your own horn so you don't have to, but um, I, I guess notwithstanding your mascot, none of you ever uh, deliver any BS in the industry. And, and I think the reason you got such high caliber um, quality faculty um, and, and deans and trustees is because of you three uh, and the, um, the consistent message over you know, decades in the industry of um, um, uh, quality education um, and, and your messaging and how you treat people too within the industry. So it's a testament to you. I, I think that's how you got them. Well, thank you. Thank I, you. I appreciate that. But uh, I just, it's very, very pleased to have them one way or the other because it's been really an honor. So what's next? So first class enters November 17th. Is that when everything goes live? We we go live on November 17th. We're actually planning a live, a, stream ca- a streaming uh, webcast. Um, we're all going to be at the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs, which is probably a bad image for the people who have invested with us so far. Hey, we're at the Broadmoor. No, it is a it is a SACA all committee conference that we will be attending. This really our our program was was birthed at SACA. I mean, for lack of a better phrase, this is where we first started talking about it a year ago, and we just felt it was very appropriate to be able to take it live while we're at SACA. So we will actually take the virtual campus live on November 17th. People who have pre-registered their access will actually be activated on November 21st because we recognize that most of us will be at Broadmoor and unable to provide any technical support. And there will be questions. It's a complex system. There'll be some questions. And and I'm sure we've tested things. There may be some technical issues. Uh, we want to be at least in the office to answer the phone or the support tickets if they come in. So, But the, the official campus will go live on November 17th. Great. So before we wrap up, any, any final closing Thoughts here from the three of you gentlemen on workcompcollege.com? Well, we, we do support, every, we, we appreciate all the support we've gotten and we're looking for a, a very wide participation in the workers' comp community. So please visit our website, take advantage of all that Bob and Mark and I have put together so it, it'll advance the overall uh, industry, our organization, and create something that people want to aspire to being part of. It's pretty amazing too. I mean, Bob, you have a human resources background continually in uh, in surveys from employees, the number one thing that we see is, you know, we, we want our employer to invest in us. Right. Uh, and what an incredible offering for claims organizations to come around and, and have this because it really doesn't exist out there. Maybe piecemeal in some respects, but this is, to my knowledge, the first sort of holistic um, off educational offering uh, that provides um, curriculum around every possible aspect and then some of workers' compensation uh, at, a, at a really reasonable price to not exclude folks. Um, so, I mean, I imagine this will be a great benefit to uh, claims employers out there who want to who want to have this offering too. I think it's yeah, well, pretty incredible. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. I, I appreciate that, and I think I, I would agree with you. I think that. As I've said with other people, there there are some you know there's some competent training systems out there, and there are some that touch on the human element. They have a class or two related to interactions with human beings. This is really the first core program to try and take that whole big picture and come up with a standard of best practices across the spectrum that would provide that understanding that Mark talked about about every facet of the the industry. Uh, it is a very comprehensive program. It's been an honor to to be able to do it to work with uh, Mark and with Don and with all the people who've come forward to uh, to help and support. Uh, this really will be a, a community effort and built by the community for the community. And it's it's just an honor. You know, I'm a big re- workers recovery fan. So to be able to have that workers recovery professional and I'm hearing instructors talk about the reco- workers recovery concept, it, it it really just feels like we're 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 going to be able to make a difference. You know, I was a, I was a terrible Boy Scout. I was the longest running tenderfoot in the history of Durango, Colorado's Troop 504. Uh, but I liked camping. And I, the one thing I took away from scouts was that you always leave a campsite better than you found it. And I think all of us, uh, the, the, my partners and I and the trustees, the deans, the faculty, all of us are really focused on leaving a better workers' compensation industry than the one we found. And, uh, and there are a lot of good people. We want to bring new good people into the industry. And this is really what we're hoping to do. Yeah, it's it's one of the most innovative ideas that I've seen that incorporates kind of every aspect of what 
folks like us are trying to do in the workers' compensation industry. Uh, and it's a really um, altruistic, selfless thing that, that you all did here. And I can see the legacy of this lasting for, you know, indefinitely. Um, and I'm so thankful we had you on here to talk about workcompcollege.com. And I'd encourage all the listeners to go to the website um, and uh, get involved with this organization, either as a student uh, or as a supporter. And uh, I just, Don and Bob and Mark, appreciate your uh, time today very much on the It's Settled podcast. Well, thank you, Sean. Appreciate your support. Yeah, Great thanks for having time. us, Sean. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for this episode of It's Settled, the Amitros podcast. For more information and episodes, you can visit us at our website at amitros.com. That's A-M-E-T-R-O-S dot com. Or head over to iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We hope you enjoyed this episode and look forward to sharing more stories of people overcoming their workplace accidents and bodily injury claims and those who are working hard to make a difference for them. So it's settled. We'll see you next time.